friends. Welcome back to the Hearing Jesus podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Grohl. Today we are in Matthew chapter 19. We're picking up at verse 16. We're picking up where we left off yesterday. And if you're just joining us, I'd encourage you to go back at least to yesterday so you could hear the beginning half of this message. But what we're doing is we're going through this gospel, the introduction to the gospel series, where we're going through the gospel of Matthew, and I'm explaining the history and the background and the culture to help you have a better understanding of the scripture, not ever to replace but to supplement your Bible reading. And so if you'd like to dive a little bit deeper, we have a bunch of resources for you. You can find those in the show notes or you can head to shehears.org. I do daily journaling prompts that help you get this information from your head to your heart. I do family discussion guides and we also teach this information to kids on the Hearing Jesus for Kids podcast. So again, just all extra resources to help you hear God's voice more clearly. So picking up at verse 16, and I'm reading from the NASB version right now. And someone came to him and said, Teacher, what good thing shall I do so that I may obtain eternal life? And he said to him, Why are you asking me about what is good? There is only one who is good. But if you want to enter, keep the commandments. Then he said to him, Which ones? And Jesus said, You shall not commit murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, All these I have kept, what am I still lacking? Jesus said to him, if you want to be complete, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But when the young man heard this statement, he went away grieving for he was one who owned much property. And Jesus said to the disciples, truly, I say to you, it will be hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were very astonished and said, then who can be saved? And looking at them, Jesus said to them, with people, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Then Peter responded and said to him, behold, we have left everything and followed you. What then will there be for us? And Jesus said to them, truly, I say to you that you who have followed me in the regeneration, when the son of man will sit on his glorious throne, you shall also sit upon 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel and everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or farms on account of my name will receive many times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. So the situation that opens up this scene is a situation that was actually pretty common at the time, both with the Jewish population and with the Greek tradition, where there were these young aristocratic young men who wanted to study under a famous teacher, but they were often too entitled or spoiled to actually do what the teacher asked of them. And this conversation is initially starting with questions about the law. So the man is asking Jesus which of the laws he needs to keep. But then Jesus goes in to talk about a few of the commandments, and then he impacts one more specifically. This phrase that he says, go and sell your possessions. This section has almost nothing to do with the keeping of the law, even though that was the initial topic that they were discussing. But instead, what Jesus is doing is something that he did frequently, which is expose the things that were in somebody's heart that was blocking someone from their path of transformation. So for this man, it wasn't the law, even though that's what he had started that conversation as. For him, it was money. And Jesus was testing this rich young man in this area And that was the area that he was the weakest, the most vulnerable, his money. And let me make it clear that money in and of itself is not a problem. We need money in order to accomplish the things that God has called us to do. To go on the mission field, I need money. To sponsor children in Africa, we need money. To buy a Bible, we need money. To take my kids to school, we need money for gas in a car. So that's not the problem. But for this man, his wealth was his place of security. And that is the one thing that was really keeping him from following God. So this man is wishing he could do some kind of, what's he say, good thing to get eternal life. And we know that there's nothing you can do to earn your way into heaven. It's a matter of surrendering your heart to Jesus. But this man was not willing to put Jesus above his wealth and his possessions. And so let's not take this out of context and try to say that all believers should sell all their possessions and get rid of 
with them. And I've actually heard that taught where there's a, this call to just live missionally and sell everything. That's not what this is saying. There's not anything wrong with having nice things as long as they're not getting in the way of your relationship with God and they can't be taking a higher priority than God. So chasing after wealth should be secondary. Now, if wealth comes and if we are blessed and the favor of God is upon us and we have wealth, that's one thing. But us chasing wealth is something completely different. See, God expects us to provide for the needs of our families and the needs for others. That's part of that kingdom mentality. And so a blessing of finances is not inherently evil. But when we start elevating that above God in our lives, it can take us down a really dangerous path. And so in this discussion of these various commandments, most of the people, not just this guy, but most of the people at the time would have been able to say, well, I keep all those commandments. But this one that Jesus is pushing back on, I think is something we need to take a look at. It's this commandment to love your neighbor as yourself. And there were not many teachers at that time that would demand that that kind of thing from their disciples, let alone what we see Jesus doing. But we see Jesus But we see Jesus demanding something radical because we know that Jesus was pretty radical for his time, but he is pushing for something that even the Jewish charity laws would not allow for. And so this was a pretty severe test, not necessarily to see if this guy would value Jesus above his possessions, but if that claim to love his neighbor as himself was really true. And what we find out in the story is that it's not. And so The Jewish culture in general would not say that rich people did not have a place within the kingdom of God because many of the leaders themselves were rich. But Jesus is making this point that someone that has an abundance of wealth and is not giving to those that are destitute and they're not loving God and loving others the way that he has provided for them to do so, then they are missing it. It's that heart posture, that heart led righteousness that he's been teaching about during this entire book. And then I want to jump back down to verse 32 and where it says the first will be last and the last will be first. In any culture, there are people in the society that rise up to be the first. In our culture, it would be like the celebrities and the wealthy. In their culture, it was probably religious leaders of the time and the wealthy. And it's because of their wealth or their education or their status or their talent or even their opportunities. They have this higher status that the culture elevates. That happened in their time frame, and it happens in our time frame. But what Jesus is saying here is in his kingdom, that's not necessarily how things work. The people that have the high social status in the culture are probably going to be the ones at the back of the line. And the people that are unknown, that are living their lives surrendered and obedient to God, but nobody else knows about them, those are the ones that are going to be elevated to a higher place within the kingdom. And I think it's a reminder of how Jesus is radical. He does things differently than everybody else does. And we have to remember that as the author of the law, he is the one that has the correct interpretation of the law. And so we need to listen and pay attention to what he's saying. And so what we learn in this passage is that even if people are known that Jesus values them for their hearts, he sees their hearts and their faithfulness and their purity and their love for him. And it's not about their outward appearance, what the world sees them doing. It's about what God sees them doing. So given that insight, I'm going to go back and I'm going to reread starting at verse 16. It says, and someone came to him and said, teacher, what good things shall I do so that I may obtain eternal life? And he said to him, why are you asking me about what is good? There's only one who is good. But if you want to enter, keep the commandments. Then he said to him, which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not commit murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all these I have kept, what am I still lacking? Jesus said to him, if you want to be complete, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. But when the young man heard this statement, he went away grieving for he was one who owned much property. And Jesus said to his disciples, truly, I say to you, it will be hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were astonished and said, then who can be saved? And looking at them, Jesus said to them, with people, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. 
Then Peter responded and said to him, Behold, we have left everything and followed you. What then will there be for us? And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, that you who have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or farms on account of my name will receive many times as much and will inherit eternal life, but many who are first will be last and the last first. God, we recognize that according to our own behavior or our own mind frame or our own position in life, that this is impossible, that the only way we can enter heaven is because God makes things possible. So God, we come to you with surrendered hearts today. God, would you point out for us the things that are stumbling blocks in our relationship with you? And maybe for us, it's not the finances and the wealth that it was for this young man. Maybe for us, it's something else. God, would you bring that to the tip of our hearts even right now as we are thinking about it and as we are praying, God, would you reveal to us the things you want us to lay down so that we could fully come and chase after you? God, we thank you for the way that you reveal your heart through your word. I pray for my friends today that you would just bless them and you would protect them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, friends. Thanks for listening.